This episode has been re-uploaded to correct an error in a trace of Barufka's algorithm. My thanks go out to YouTube user the L underscore T for pointing out the error and giving me the opportunity to fix it. I apologize if I have inadvertently misled you. Minimum spanning trees. We've taken a look at two different techniques to get them so far, and arguably they are the most popular techniques, at least going off what is taught in school. Today, we're going to look at two more techniques. These appear to be less popular, or they appear to be older. I guess the reason why I'm showing you these two techniques is to show you that there are many ways of tackling the same problem. And well, they can be very different. So yeah, today's episode is really more just a fun episode, and to sort of give you a more well-rounded understanding of minimum spanning trees. You're watching episode 8 of Graph Theory. Hello and welcome back to Graph Theory. Today, we're going to take a look at two algorithms, namely Barufka's algorithm and the reverse delete algorithm. And both of these algorithms are different approaches to getting minimum spanning trees. We're not going to go into very in-depth traces, neither are we going to discuss all the more in-depth things like time complexity. This is just for your general understanding, for you to know that such algorithms, such approaches exist out there. First, let us begin with Barufka's algorithm. This algorithm is actually kinda a cross between Prims and Kraskill's, despite the fact that this algorithm actually predates both of the two. It contains an element similar to Prims in the sense that we are trying to reach out from a particular point, but at the same time we do it in little disconnected components, the way Kraskill's does it. It's very interesting, albeit a little complex. Let's take a look at the traits. So let us begin by looking at Barufka's algorithm. Now, right off the bat, you can see that this algorithm is really complex, there are multiple nested loops, so let's try and break it down first before we try to get anywhere. So the idea behind Barufka's algorithm, as mentioned, is very similar to both Prims and Kraskill's. The part that is similar to Kraskill's is on the outside. We are actually going to form a set of disconnected trees just as in Kruskal's. The part that looks like Prim's algorithm is the part inside the loop. Now, basically what we're doing here is something like this. As long as we have more than one disconnected component, we're gonna have to delve into this loop and do more work. For each disconnected component, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with an empty list. Then we're gonna look at every vertex within that one component. For each vertex, we're going to look for the cheapest outgoing edge. When I say outgoing, what I mean is we want to look for an edge that connects that particular node to a node outside of the current component. So yeah, we want to find the cheapest one of these edges and add them to this edge list. So what we get by the time we end up at this line is a list of edges. These edges are the edges outgoing from the current component and they are the cheapest one for each vertex. Out of all these edges, which are held in list L, we then have to find the cheapest edge in that list. So basically, well, we can sort of simplify this by expressing things like this. For each connected component, we want to find the cheapest outgoing edge at each vertex. Then out of those edges, we want to find the cheapest one and then add that to the forest F. Now, the first pass of Barufka's algorithm is extremely trivial, because basically, every single vertex is its own disconnected component. As a result, what we're going to do is we're going to visit every component, look for its cheapest outgoing edge, and then simply add that to the forest F. Let's see how this works out. We have a list of components here, just to, you know, help us keep track of what we're doing. First, we look at component A. Now, out of the outgoing edges from A, the cheapest edge is right here, so we pick it. Then we move on to B. Once again, the cheaper of the two edges would be this one here, so we pick that. And, well, if we repeat this logic, essentially what we're doing is we're just going to every single node, 
picking the cheapest outgoing edge. And well, what we get at the end of the day is a set of components, which I have color coded in this manner. Now, I actually want to draw your attention to one particular interesting thing here. For example, at this particular slide, we are supposed to be looking at component J. Now, clearly the cheapest outgoing edge from component J would be this edge right here. However, because this edge has already been picked by node E, it appears that we didn't actually do anything this iteration. In fact, if we were to take a closer look at the code, we realize that there is nothing to check to see if an edge has already been picked. Regardless of whether an edge has been picked before, we're going to pick it anyway. And it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, as long as we get our components, then everything is just fine. In this case, double picking the same edge wouldn't be a problem. So at this stage of the algorithm, what we have are a number of disconnected components. Since this particular statement here is not yet false, we'll have to enter the second pass of our algorithm. Now, remember that we are only doing this for each connected component, which is why we only need to run this algorithm for four iterations, once for each differently colored component, which are of course disconnected. So let's begin. Right now we are looking at this component here, and we're looking at all the outgoing edges. So of course, that would be this step. We're going to be looking at every vertex that connects to a vertex that is outside of this component. Which is why, of course, we don't have to do anything for, say, vertex i right here, because it doesn't connect us to any external components. So yeah, we only need to look at these edges here. Once we have that, we want to look for the cheapest of these edges. That would, of course, be this edge right here. And basically, we add that to the forest and we are done with looking at this component. So we move on to our next component, CDG. Once again, there are many edges to be looking at, and in fact, in this case, we actually have a tie. A lot of the times you'll find that in graph algorithms, we don't really have a very good way of breaking a tie, so as long as we do it in a consistent manner, that would be fine. So in this case, I'm gonna be picking this edge. Once we're done with that, once again, we can move on to the next item. Now, for the item F and K, well, these are the edges it needs to consider. Of course, we've already picked these edges in a previous pass, so yeah, we don't really have to do anything for this particular iteration. Finally, we look at the last connected component, HL. Of course, we look at the two outgoing edges, and we pick the smaller one of the two. So that would be this edge right here. So now that we are basically done with our second pass of the algorithm, notice that basically everything is now connected to everything else. What this means of course is that we are ready to terminate because, well, this condition no longer evaluates the troop. We have exactly one component in a forest. In other words, we are done. And that's it for Barufka's algorithm. It is a little bit on the complex side, but I think its intention is clear, and well, it gets the job done. So with that done, let us move on to the reverse delete algorithm, which personally, I find quite innovative. Alright, let us now look at the reverse delete algorithm. Now, this one is pretty innovative, but we'll take it from the top, and we'll see the cool parts as we get there. So first and foremost, we need to create an edge list. Basically, it contains all the edges in a graph, and what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna sort it in decreasing order of their edge weights. Then basically what we're gonna do is for every edge, we're gonna try and remove it and see if that actually breaks our tree. If it doesn't, then that's good. We're gonna keep it gone. If it does break it, then we'll have to reinsert it. So yeah, in fact, what this means is at the beginning of the algorithm, all the edges are actually implicitly selected. We're going to then go into removing them one by one until we cannot remove any more. So yeah, it's actually a very interesting look at this from a completely opposite perspective. Let's trace this and see it in action. First, we look at the edge AF. We can get rid of it, and as you can see, we have found an alternative path between the two vertices. So that's good, this edge can remain gone. 
Next up for DH, same deal, we do have an alternative path. Once again, GK can also be safely deleted. Same deal for BC, the path is kinda long, but that doesn't matter, as long as we can connect the two, then the deletion is valid. Once again for FJ, we can find an alternative path. But then as we move on, we aren't so lucky. Notice that the removal of this edge here will cause C to become disconnected from the rest of the nodes. As a result, this deletion is invalid, and we're gonna actually have to put that edge back. Moving on once again, well, this happens for this edge as well. And this, and in fact for the next edge, we're in pretty huge trouble, because we've actually disconnected our tree into two big pieces. So no, we cannot delete this edge. Basically, the same deal applies for all the subsequent edge removals. We realize that we cannot reliably remove any more edges, because well, every time we try to do that, some part of the graph gets broken away. The algorithm now terminates, and every edge we have left actually forms our minimum spanning tree. So yeah, that is how the reverse delete algorithm works. And there you go, that is the reverse delete algorithm. The fact that it sort of starts with all the edges and starts taking them away shows that there are many ways we can approach one problem. The fact that this algorithm is actually a subtractive algorithm instead of an additive one shows us that there are many different ways to approach a problem. And these different techniques actually require very different methods of thinking, despite the fact that the intention is the same and the end result is the same. So yeah, it's actually a good lesson when it comes to doing any algorithms work in general. There isn't one solution to a problem. Despite the fact that many algorithms exist out there, creativity is still encouraged. So that basically rounds it out for all discussions on minimum spanning trees. I think we've spent quite a lot of time on this subject and it's time to move on. This series is actually almost done. We're gonna look at a few more, more complex algorithms some of which will require even a little bit more background. So we're gonna go a little bit slower for those episodes. And yeah, hopefully they will continue to be fruitful. Anyway, that's it. That's all there is for this particular episode. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, you're watching 0612TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may want to check out a playlist of the other videos in this series. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.